This conference will now be recorded. I'd like to call the finance personnel meeting for July 20th, 2021 to order. Um, since we do not have a chair in attendance, but we have a quorum, we, I would need a nomination for someone to chair this meeting. I nominate Tracy. Second. And Tracy is chair. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, then um, let's take roll call, please. Uh, Tracy Pluki? Here. Tom Selk? Here. Allison Burnett? Here. Allison Williams? Here. And Chris Serbel's excused. Um, please stand for Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, motion for action on the agenda. I move we approve the agenda. Second. second. Motion second. All those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Action on the minutes from the regular meeting June 15th, 2021. Move to approve. Second. Moved and second. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Comments from the public. It does not appear we have any public. Um, I'll say it one more time. Any comments from the public? All right, we will move on. Um, action on consent items, um, the investment report. Greg, do you have anything you would like to go through with us on that? The only thing I, I guess I would say is that the market's always late, so the last two months we've seen a lot of um, portfolio depreciation. You know, it gets kind of complicated with all the different pieces of that. There's still interest income, but it's um, a little bit of depreciation of the value of the portfolio. But I would suspect that that'll kind of level out and then pick up towards the end of the year. Move to approve the consent agenda. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Um, item 8A, action item, um, fingerprint fees, action on the fingerprint fees. Brian, I don't know if you have anything you would like to go through with us. No, this was brought to my attention uh, earlier this year um, as an option to increase our fees. Um, as you can see, we, we do take a number of uh, fingerprints from the public. Um, it talks about the uh, fingerprint equipment grant that we applied for. Uh, we did get that in the sum of uh, just over 19,000, uh, but we also have a match of just over 2,200 as well. So we'll have those fees. Um, we'll have uh, a BadgerNet connection fee as well that we have to pay for. Uh, that connection is uh, what the state requires to talk uh, to them to get the database and fingerprints into them along with the time system. So that coupled with our officers, obviously time and energy, um, they're requesting uh, that we raise the fees up to $25 for citizen prints and $40 for court ordered. The other thing that I will mention is that in a lot of the area surrounding agencies are not doing this anymore. So they expect uh, more people to be coming in and using our services. Um, and they had listed uh, some of the area services around here. Um, and as you can see on that on that second part, a lot of places are are not in service right now. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. What, who would be a citizen coming in to get a fingerprint? It's usually for employment purposes they're, that their employer requires them to get prints. Teachers especially, they have to get those. So. <clears throat> Excuse me, my next question is court ordered. How many of these are collectible? <laughs> no offense. <laughs> yeah, that, you know, that's hard for me to say. And we don't get a whole lot of court order prints. Usually those go through the county, but once in a while we may get some. Okay. Thank you. Brian, I have a question on the grant, just to clarify. So we received the grant already, and we have upgraded our equipment already, or we are in the process of maybe doing that? We're in the process. It was approved. So okay. we, haven't, we haven't received the new equipment yet. Okay. 
So we're in the process of getting the new equipment, and then it'll cost the village another about two thousand for the match for the grant. Just correct? over two thousand, yeah. Okay. It's a twenty-two hundred dollars system, I believe. Okay. And when do you think that would be up and and running? Will it be this year yet, or next year? Or? It, it should be this year. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, other question is, what is the cost for us to provide the service? So who does the fingerprinting? Is it an officer? Is it one of the office staff? Are there certain hours that they can have the fingerprints done? It's a, yeah, it's usually done during the day. Um, normally our evidence tech will do it, yeah. but our officers are also trained to do that as well, so depending on the availability. And do we have non-residents coming in, and if so, do we charge a higher fee for non-residents, or do we provide the same service for everybody? Regardless, at the same cost. They're requesting the same cost for everyone. So it looks like there was no fingerprinting done in 2020 or 2021. Is that because we didn't have the system up, or is it well, just not much of it was because of COVID. We closed it all down. Okay, so we have not done it for the last year and a half. About. Well, they've started doing it just recently again, but I don't think they've done very many thus far this year. Okay. Any other questions that anybody have? You guys always have lots of questions for me. That's fantastic. I know. Well, and I'm just wondering if it's a certain, like, <laughs> you look at your list of people that you, in, you know, to see who has it. Just wondering if it's a service we should get. But then if we got the grant and we have the money already, then it's like, well, we probably should do it and probably have it and maybe it it can be a revenue source if we're one of few in the area that are actually offering it yeah and we're, and we're not trying to make a you know no. a lot of money on it we're just trying to cover our costs basically yeah. and our expenses that we have um, i think it's a valuable service there are a lot of people that do need it for their employment yeah. um, and come in and they need that and especially a lot of areas around here aren't doing it i think we're going to see more I mean, I think you have to base the cost of a service based on what you just factored, which is the equipment you need to facilitate and the training needed. And clearly, a lot of entities are exiting this service or limiting this service. And if we already have the technology and our staff is trained, I think that the fees being proposed are reasonable. Thank you. Oh, if there's no other questions, I'll make a motion. Um, to increase the fee for to $25 for ink and digital prints and $40 for court ordered prints and to send it to the village board for final approval. Second. Moved and second. Any other questions or anything? Otherwise, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Item 8B is general fund financials. So what we've put together here is just a look at where we're at in the general fund for the year. Um, the report itself is going to give you kind of a summary statement of revenues, expenditures, change in fund balance, and then it'll go into the revenues um, more detail and more detail with the expenditures. You're looking at a year-to-date, uh, June year-to-date versus full year budget. Uh, so it's already, um, the numbers in some ways are difficult to to read. So what I'll, I'll tell you is this, we're pretty much right on course with budget. Um, hotel revenue has been better than expected. Uh, I think some of the permitting may have been a little bit better than expected at this point. So there may be some, some opportunity from a revenue perspective. I would expect costs to be uh, in line with budget as we go along. But you have to remember that we did budget a $325,000 deficit in the 2021 budget. So any gains it would help would just help lessen that negative impact to the, the fund balance. But overall, I think things are going well um, as as compared to what budget uh, is, is, is um, planned to do. Lakes open, a lot of services are wide open again. So all those things. This is just information only. I have no question. I just have a question on permits. You had said, when you mentioned permits, you're talking about the building permits. Mm -hmm. I was kind of surprised they were as low as they were with all the building that appears to be going on. Yeah, some of it's just timing. So it's a matter of when they come in and actually 
pull them. Like we know we're going to have some construction, but sometimes they don't, they, they wait till last minute or some other things go on. But yeah, I think just hearing what's out there, some of them have come in a little bit better than we anticipated. So overall that that's one of those, it's more of a timing, timing issue. How does the village manage the quote cash situation? Because your income is only, you know, a million four and your expenses are seven million. How, how, how does that work? So we have a pretty high fund balance. Um, we haven't really, from a revenue perspective, haven't really recognized tax revenue, even though we get a big influx of it in January. After the August settlement is when the big revenue piece of tax will come on the books. So it's more or less a time and the cash is there from the first installment. So we'll, we'll run high cash balances and we'll draw off of them down into the end of July. And then come August, we get the final settlement with the county. And then we'll get another big cash influx and then that'll push us through the rest of the year. So we don't recognize, technically recognize the tax revenue until August. That's just kind of the standard accounting. So you've got the cash. We have the cash. You have the cash. Okay. Right. And then we have, you that, know, that fund balance. The confusing part for me, it was like, yeah. where's the cash? Yeah. Correct. There's cash there. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. So that kind of explains where on the bottom of page 10, it has a fund balance of 2031 of 20 was just over 5 million. And then 630 fund balance is 12,000. So that really answers that. That was my Correct. question. Correct. So the revenue from taxes will be coming in August and that fund balance then will increase. Yeah, and that fund balance for okay. July will probably be negative. Okay. It, this is just an, an exercise here. If we were to do some <laughs> fully audited statements, that wouldn't be the case because you would accrue that revenue with the taxes. But because we run a, you know, January 1, December 31st, we'll recognize all that revenue in, for August settlement. Okay. Good question. Any other questions or anything else, Greg, you want to share with us on the general fund? No. And that was informational only, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, next agenda is the 2022 budget timeline. So every year uh, we put together a timeline, uh, just information of kind of the budget process. I've already started that process internally with, you know, files and documents, but the, it goes through a listing of all the, the key dates, starting with the introduction, introduction of the timeline here and the next week to village board. Um, the big kickoff meeting internally is on Thursday, August 19th, where we go through expectations, um, you know, strategies, the planning, um, kind of where they, you know, what are we think we're going to have from a budget perspective. And then staff, um, we will come back to the board in August with some more um, information on key priorities, targets, you know, things like tax rate, tax levy, those types of things. We will know by then, um, assess uh, the, um, the equalized values will be pretty well set by then. We'll have a feel for how our market evaluation is going, those types of things, and provide information along the way. So there's just d dates in here. And then the staff has um, until September 20th to turn it in. And then from there, we have internal meetings, go through each budget, uh, each department with, with the department heads. And I'm uh, still waiting on information from the state as well. That continues all the way up until the end of October. But basically, most of all of October is really just a review and, and a process and getting to where we want to be um, in a final budget. And then it, at the end of the at the end of the process is the November board meeting where we formally adopt it. The other big key date in here is Tuesday, November 9th will be the full budget review where we have joint review with or joint finance personnel and village board to go through the budget in, in greater detail. I have no questions on the timeline. I haven't been through it on the finance side of things, but I have now enough times on the village board and I think the timeline works very smoothly. So um, I will make a motion to approve the budget 2022 budget timeline as presented. Second. Oh, second. Oh, 
Oh, I just have one question, Greg, on this. Um, I notice in the August 24th meeting when it goes to Village Board, you're gonna discuss the, is it the American Rescue, is that what it's called, ARPA yes, yes. Um, funds? Is there any way that either this evening you can give us a brief, like how much it is, what is what it's eligible or what we can use that for, or it could come back to this committee maybe at our August meeting and talk about that, because that's a big chunk of money that's coming to us, correct? And it would be nice for us to know what types of budget or what types of things we can purchase with that or how that can impact our budget going forward. Right, and that's exactly what we will do at that meeting. That's why it's listed on that timeline. Um, it's just under the first, we got half of our installment, which was 890 some thousand dollars is a pretty large amount. And so, yeah, we have to have a plan. There's still a lot of chatter on use and, and how it's gonna be reported and all the, you know, the follow-up reporting if and when with the state and, and all that. So we will then talk internally and kind of have a, a, some ideas of what we wanna do and then bring it up with the board. Ultimately, the board will make the final decisions on how we spend that money. But as we get into the budget season as well, it's a good opportunity to identify some projects that maybe we can, can use versus tax levy dollars we can use the funds for. I was just wondering, Mayor, I wasn't clear, if it could come back to this committee too? Are we gonna discuss, I know it's going to the 24th and maybe I'm missing it on here because it's going to Village Board right on August 24th to talk about that, but will it come back here at all just to discuss that funding source or is that not in the process or do you think that's not necessary? Yeah, we can certainly do that. Uh, in fact, just kind of touching on Greg's point, we just, as of yesterday at 1045, received some additional information from the league that produced information from the U.S. Treasury that provides additional information on the use of ARPA. So this is just kind of a constantly evolving yeah. effort. Um, we'll certainly talk on the, the few elements that are considered eligible expenses or, or uses of the ARPA funds. Uh, in particular, one of the, the key ones that we'll likely be looking to utilize is that lost revenue as a result of the pandemic that generally will provide the greatest amount of flexibility for us to supplement our budget process. With that, and we certainly we'll get into details in, in, in more, uh, we'll get into more details at the next meeting. But one of the components to that is understanding what those lost revenues are. And so we, we may have a good understanding of what they are in from 2020. Uh, as we continue on through this year, we'll have a, a continually better opportunity to understand what they are for this fiscal year. But then we also have funding that'll come in that second installment that will cover the year fiscal year 2022. So we're kind of taking from a staff perspective a very cautious approach to the use of ARPA because we don't know how much of an impact it's going to be to our general fund revenues. And we wanna make sure that we provide an opportunity to supplement that if, if need be. Okay. Thank you. All right, so there's a motion in the second. Any other questions or discussion, anybody? I say, um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. And let's see. Purchasing policy is the next agenda item. In your packet is a draft purchasing policy that was put together by administration. Primarily since this, my start with the village of Ashwaubenon, I've had a number of inquiries from department heads and various supervisors and managers to, to get an idea of what my policy would be as it relates to purchases and so on. Inevitably, I'd ask, well, what is the village's policy as it relates to purchases? And um, to my knowledge, no formal purchasing policy has existed for a period of time with the village. And so uh, what I wanted to do is establish a written form policy uh, as it relates to purchases that kind of matches the um, process and procedures that we have been using from a village's perspective. Uh, we're breaking purchases into kind of two main categories. One, considered general purchases. So that's pretty much all your day-to-day -day type stuff. Uh, and then we have purchases related to public construction projects. And those are uh, mandated to follow a, a specific set of procedures under state statutes. So for general purposes, 
purchases. Again, these are not public construction projects under the guise of statute overview. Uh, we have general budgeted purchases of less than $5,000. So in, in these particular cases, a department head and their, de their designee is responsible for ensuring that um, they follow appropriate purchasing processes as outlined in the policy, uh, that they're getting competitive pre um, quotes or prices from various vendors in order to uh, make that purchase. The next purchasing category is purchases between $5,000 and $24,999. And there's two, two main reasons for uh, creating this separation. Um, one, obviously, we're getting into higher dollar amounts. Um, and so we want to make sure that we uh, improve up upon our competitiveness as it relates to the pre procurement of goods and services. Uh, but two, also uh, under statutes for public construction projects, projects over $5,000 but under $25,000 require public notice. And so by adding an additional layer of kind of overview on those purchases, we can ensure that we are maintaining statutory compliance in the event that it is a public construction project. With that purchase level, uh, department heads can go through an informal competitive procurement process of which has some overview by our purchasing agent, which would be our finance director and Greg, just ensuring that the funds are available and that the process has been filed appropriately. The next category would be purchases between $25,000 and $49,999. Again, uh, that's primarily, you know, obviously a larger threshold. These are items that are, that are, again, budgeted. So these are not unbudgeted expenditures. These are planned for and approved by the village board um, leading into that fiscal year. In this particular case, um, a more formal competitive bidding process is required, uh, of which um, bidders are going to be actively seeking uh, an invitation to bid. There's going to be specifications written. There are going to be some kind of bidding procedure outlined. And, and although not formally sealed bids per se, there's got to be some kind of formal effort uh, done on behalf of the village in order to procure that, that, that purchase or, or service. Uh, in this particular case, um, we want to have some oversight so the village manager's office will review that, that kind of bidding process to make sure that the specifications are written, that there's a, uh, a fair and equal process for bidders to, to provide a proposal for services, um, and then ultimately a process for opening those bids. And then the final would be anything over $50,000. Uh, in this particular case, following the, the latter pr procedure pretty much uh, to a T, uh, but with this dollar amount here, we're dealing with higher volumes of money, obviously uh, has a much greater impact to the overall budget. Even though they are, are budgeted purchases, um, the village board would still have another uh, kick at the kitty, if you will, by approving that purchase uh, following the appropriate process. Uh, for non-budgeted purposes, uh, our budgeted purchases, um, there's a threshold of basically $2,500. So these are unplanned, unassumed expenditures uh, within the budget. In that particular case, those items need to follow those same procedures based on the dollar value, but in all likelihood, anything over $2,500 is going to require board approval. Uh, public construction contracts are going to follow state statutes and the provisions there, and that's outlined in the policy. A couple of things I want to point out on contracts. So contracts are awarded by the village board, and through that contract, um, there's gen there, there is a project budget that's identified as part of that contract. And so a project manager is generally going to be assigned to that. I'll give you a, a case in point, our mill and pave program, our public works department oversees that, whether that's Doug Martin or Steve Burr that's managing that, that project. Um, if a change order were to come into that, that fit within the overall project budget, that project manager has the ability to approve that, that change order. Ultimately, the village board will approve any pay requests. Within those pay requests will be a list of all the change orders that were approved. So, of course, the village board will ultimately have uh, oversight on that. If a con public construction contract requires a, various, uh, a change in scope or exceeds the overall project budget, then in those cases, those items would come back before the village board. Uh, there are provisions in the event that, you know, it just something very unforeseen happened uh, and in order to not delay the project and wait 30 days before the village board can hear it there are provisions within the policy to allow us to proceed with it 
um, so long as it kind of meets the intended outcome of the overall project. Uh, this policy covers emergency purchases, credit card purchases, the requirement for, for receipts, uh, internet purchases, which is becoming more and more prevalent, uh, and then some budgetary and, and process controls. A uh, couple things that I will point out um, that this policy does provide for that we may work with other governmental units within this policy to set up a formal bidding process. An example is maybe we wanna go out and buy an ambulance and we're gonna spec the same ambulance that another agency is gonna spec out and we're gonna build that, bid that collectively. Uh, so as, if we work with, let's say the city of Green Bay, Green Bay in doing that, we don't have to set up our own formal bidding we would just work with Green Bay's bid. The state of Wisconsin routinely bids out vehicles. Uh, and so if we wanted to use the state bid or state um, bid awards for vehicles and, and other equipment, we could do that as well without going through that formal bidding requirement. So that is a component of the policy as well. Uh, with that, I'll answer any questions. I do know that there is one uh, area that needed to be corrected. Um, Tom actually pointed it out earlier today. So under uh, page five, under subcategory eight, internet purchases, uh, there is a sentence in there where it should state employees should not open an account on behalf of the village. So ultimately, if when we set up internet purchases, as an example, we utilize, let's say, Amazon for some business supply needs, uh, our finance department sets up that account so that employees can purchase from it. And that employees aren't just setting up random accounts on their own accord. Uh, so with that, uh, we would recommend uh, approval of the policy as it's written with that correction under item eight uh, to that sentence uh, regarding employees should not open an account on behalf of the village. I guess more of a comment than a question. I think it's great to have something in writing that can be a guideline for departments. I guess I would like to see maybe after six months to a year of implementation, if the purchases in the area of between 5,000 to 24,999, especially those under 10,000, if this process is maybe lengthening the ability to make decisions for staff members, I just know on a day-to-day -day basis, like I personally, through my role in government, have to you know, approve expenditures for survey work or environmental services, and a lot of them do come in above $5,000. And I mean, maybe it's just looking at the department level of what do those competitive procedures look like, but sometimes, you know, when you're in a busy building environment, a busy development environment, you wanna give employees the latitude to make decisions quickly and trust that they have relationships and know where the best prices lie rather than make a process more bureaucratic than it needs to be. Yeah, we can certainly take a look at that. And I think the intent here is just, you know, in that particular case, let's say you need to have an environmental agency come out and do a, a quick study, and we know it's going to be five to seven thousand dollars. It's kind of the standard for a few hours worth of work in the field and a, a written report. Um, and so, I think the intent here is okay. Talk to one agency, talk to another agency, and you have two competing proposals. That's generally uh, going to satisfy that need, and just indicate based on the time constraints and the crunch then it would be placed on that in the file for that purchase set because of the availability oftentimes of the consulting service or the timeline that was required, we could not satisfy the need of having at least three competing proposals. That makes sense. I'm also curious if the village has like preferred service providers of certain standing services, like if you have a a go-to surveyor that you use or outside legal services for anything, do those fall under this or is that something that more comes out of the finance office outside of the purchasing policy? So under uh, how I view that is under section 12, purchases that do not require prior authorization. Generally, if we've gone through a formal RFP or RFQ process and we've um, entered into an agreement with that vendor or that provider, um, anytime we work with that vendor based on that RFP or that process, they would have prior authorization. Um, the best example I could provide is our assessor. We contract our assessor services out. And so um, by default, that's our assessor until we go out 
can um, seek an, a, an additional proposal. Auditor is another good example where we switched recently because we, we felt we weren't getting um, the level of service that we needed for the complexity of our, of our agency. Any other questions, anybody? Comments? Oh, as I look for a motion, please. Nice to have this policy written. I think it'll be great for the employees that they know where the level of approvals are. And it also a little, gives you a little control from the village point of view. So well written. Thank you. I'll make a motion to uh, approve the draft of the village uh, purchasing policy. Second. Moved and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, item nine, any items for next agenda anybody have? Okay, then I would need a motion to adjourn. Moved to adjourn. Second. Moved and second, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried, thank you everybody.